Thank you for listening to Mormon Sex Info. This episode is an archived episode and is only now becoming publicly available. Mormon Sex Info relies on contributions. To contribute, please visit mormonsex.info. And now, please enjoy this episode. Hello all, this is Dan Weatherspoon posting a little bit of an intro ahead of the official intro. I just wanted to give you a heads up that this wonderful discussion that you're about to listen to is terrific, it is complex, but we discovered after we recorded that there was some choppiness and some occasional moments where the audio quality isn't as good as I would really like it to be. I hope it doesn't throw you off and make it hard for you to listen. The first half is full of vital information, especially as you're getting interested in the scientific aspects of what we're doing. So I hope you'll push through it, and I apologize for that, and just wanted to give you a heads up in advance. Mormon Matters podcast features panel discussions of topics related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Whether about Mormon teachings, scriptures, contemporary events, or Mormon culture, it seeks to explore all themes with fairness and respect, searching for robust presentations of issues and compassion for all people in questions. The podcast is a production of the Open Stories Foundation and is seeking to build financial support that will help it continue to produce important and helpful content. All donations to Mormon Matters are fully tax-deductible. To support the podcast, please become a monthly subscriber today at mormonmatters.org. Thank you for your support. Where can I turn for peace? Where is my solace? When other sources cease to make me Welcome, everyone, to another edition of the Mormon Matters Podcast. This is your host, Dan Weatherspoon. I'm excited for our episode today, which is really, really timely. There has been a back and forth in the Salt Lake Tribune editorial pages, each one offering a different side of a debate that's going on in therapy and in people trying to overcome compulsions, addictions, and things like that. And it's a debate over whether the addiction model is appropriate and the sorts of therapies that are prescribed through addiction model types of thinking if they're appropriate to use when someone struggles with uh, pornography interfering into their life in a major way, or sex, and what some people will call sex addiction. And there seems to be uh, competing studies that each side brings forth, and the other one says, no, our studies are better, and it just has become an interesting thing. But the stakes are kind of high here, and as we as we wrestle with this today, as we have this panel of four people who are on the side of things, that says the addiction model is inappropriate. We know it's out there. We know it's the dominant way that people are are seeking treatment, but we don't believe that it's as healthy as other different ways of approaching this. And so we're going to listen to them today, put forth their things, and I'm going to extend an invitation for those on the other side to also come on Mormon Matters in a different time, and then perhaps if they do, and both sides agree, we'll try to bring them on together. But I wanted to have a full hearing here of at least the side of things that is pushing for a new model, or pushing at least against the old model and the one that seems dominant. So I'm excited to have two members of the team who wrote the first op-ed in the Salt Lake Tribune. It was specifically about Fight the New Drug, which is a program that has been coming in, and it's been in Utah schools and things like that, and it is teaching the porn addiction model to high school students. So this team wrote about the problems that they saw with it. So Natasha Helfer Parker, who many know from these podcasts, Kristen Hodson, who also has been on the Morning Matters podcast before, along with Kristen Marie Benyon and Shannon Hickman, uh, two other guests, but it's uh, the first Kristen and Natasha who are on today. And they've invited a couple of special guests that I'll have them introduce a little bit as we go. So welcome back to the podcast, Natasha Helfer Parker. Would you mind telling everybody a little bit about yourself and, and your, your credentials or the reason that you feel passionate about uh, this topic? Well, thanks, Dan. It's so nice to be back on Mormon Matters. I have been a guest, I guess, a few times on your show and always love 
love that opportunity. This is a really, really important topic to me. So I'm just thrilled to be here tonight and be able to talk about this. It's important to me because of so many reasons, but mainly because I have seen so many clients throughout my career just be harmed by some of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Kristen Hodson and I are super excited to have with us tonight Dr. Nicole Prousey and Jay Blevins. And I, I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves further, but in, in general, Dr. Prousey is one of the leading neuroscientists on these topics in our country today. And uh, Jay just led a really important movement in the marriage and family therapy field towards countering some of these misperceptions in our own field. And I was very privileged to be involved with a publication that he headed that was a group effort through, why were there like 10 or 15 of us, Jay, I believe? Yeah. And um, that we wrote a piece for the California division of AMFT. So I'll let them introduce themselves further, but most people know me. I've been in private practice for almost, well, over 20 years now and mainly working with Mormons. I became a certified sex therapist about six years ago now and very devoted to this topic. Awesome. Thanks so much for being on. And Kristen, welcome back. You were on our show about sex positivity and Mormonism. Yes. Thank you for having me. It's amazing to be on with this particular group of people, because I think as you find in this interview, we're going to be able to hit it from a lot of angles um, and approach this in a really dynamic way. Super. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your therapy practice or any uh, particular things? I'm founder of The Healing Group, which is in Salt Lake City, Utah, and we just did the Rocky Mountain Sex and Intimacy Summit, trying to bring more sex positivity and dialogue in Salt Lake City. Um, I'm also a co-author of Real Intimacy, A Couple's Guide to Genuine Healthy Sexuality. And pornography inevitably comes up in my couple's work all the time. Um, and so it's something that's become a deep passion of mine because like Natasha, what I see in my office is unfortunately a harmful and having to undo a lot of the damage that's been done. And it's done by the addiction model? Am, am I setting this too much into the thing or it's just pornography I think we all agree can be harmful but it, what, is it particularly damaged because of that model the model and the messaging around the whole topic okay and we'll and we'll dive into that but yeah. hey thanks again Kristen it's great to have you back Thank you. Dr. Prousey, thank you for coming on. And Jay, also you, uh, non-Mormons, I uh, welcome to our little crazy world. Uh, we find it enjoyable and frustrating and all sorts of things. I think like anybody who is part of, uh, you know, a, a group that has been a significant part of their life and, uh, you know, there's group needs and individual needs and all sorts of stuff. And that's the kind of things we wrestle with. And I hope that we won't scare you off from, uh, from our fun discussions uh, here today. Day and you won't feel too out of place. But Dr. Prousey, would you quickly tell us a little bit about your background and how you work and uh, any of the connections you have knowing about Mormonism, I guess, maybe to start with? Sure. I actually uh, spent three years in Idaho. My first uh, position out of school was at Idaho State University. So this is kind of revisiting Mormon culture. Focatello, yeah. Yep, yep, from when I knew it. And uh, so I've actually been studying human sexual motivation since 1998 when I was a researcher at the Kinsey Institute. Uh, I got a PhD in clinical science, which I know a lot of people don't necessarily know what that is. In my case, it's a specialty in neuroscience and statistics. And I think I'm on because we have published the largest neuroscience study on the topic of uh, sex film use and problems of sex film use, in addition to a lot of other behavioral studies. And have definitely been under attack by all the people that were trying to make money off of the addiction framework. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you being on and, and taking time. I understand you're working uh, as we go a little bit here and, and really, uh, really jumping out of some, some work that you need to get to. But we appreciate you being here with us. Sure. There may or may not be some stats running in the back. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Jay Blevins, welcome. Tell us thank about you. yourself besides what Natasha added. Well, I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I have a private practice in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, where a lot of my work focuses on sex and sexuality issues. And uh, this is just a, a big area of interest for mine. I agree that I see a lot of clients that come in that have been uh, treated with a sex addiction model. And 
It has caused a lot of complications. It's created a lot of shame for them and not addressed the underlying problems for them. And uh, unfortunately, see that too often. So it's this has become, a, I think, a really important topic to work on. Awesome. And Jay, do you have any like uh, connections with Mormonism, Mormon clients, or any kind of uh, background where we, if we need to explain some lingo or anything for you? <laughs> well, I have a religion minor. Does that oh, nice. count? Um, I, you know, I'm not particularly. I think I know in general uh, some about it. I have known some practicing Mormons, but uh, you know, I'd say beyond that, uh, no direct experience and no no clients that I'm aware of. So. Okay. We'll jump in if we ever do need a quick, uh, like, oh, whoa, what's that term mean? <laughs> okay. Use yeah. that, use that, that way or something. So thank you very much for joining in. Okay, so we have a couple of op-eds, and there's two or three themes that seem to be emerging uh, from them. There's this program out there called Fight the New Drug, and it's, you know, you've seen the t-shirts and things like that is porn kills love and things along those lines. And it's it's going to, uh, to cities and various states, and uh, the people who wrote the second op-ed that was in response to Natasha and Kristen and Kristen and Shannon's uh, are basically the Fight the New Drug people, and they're claiming credentials and things like this. But one of the big issues that seem to be important for them to emphasize is we are not just a Mormon group. We are not just a religion group. We are, you know, fact-based and we're, we're looking at research and here's uh, links to 25 scientific studies on porn addiction. Here's a link to uh, something that debunks a study that they felt like Natasha and the, the others were using in their op-ed. And so they're, they're, they're kind of trying to do two things. Number one is stay away from the religious framework that uh, Natasha and her gang want to say is at play here, and they want to play in the science realm. And yet, Natasha, you would you and Kristen and all of you, really, why is it that the porn addiction model seems to be tied to a religious framework versus a scientific or a fact-based, research-based framework. Can, can we start there? Well, I think the first thing I'll say about that is that it's not just fight the new drug. We have many, many examples of sex addiction clinics throughout the country. We specifically wrote the op-ed on fight the new drug because I had received probably up into about 30 complaints regarding why they were allowed to come into the school systems in Utah. And so that's why, I guess, in a sense, we address that particular organization. Uh, Sons of Helaman is another organization that actually is much more concerning to me than Fight the New Drug that goes into church, Mormon church uh, settings all the time to do their trainings. And there's just many, many clinical settings that are really advertised as sex addiction centers to the point that there's in-treatment uh, programs that can cost up to $45,000 for a particular time frame that you spend in these places. Hmm. Now, but why, why are they, why do, why do religious people or at least conservative religious people want that, uh, that model to be the dominant one in which you address these problems through? I, I think it makes sense through our lens and I just also want to point out, as far as the religious piece, that there's been some really great research just that came out just recently that does show a correlation between those who would be more religiously conservative and those who would seek this type of treatment. So in other words, it fits the framework. We've all grown up in religious settings, very much in a fear-based, shame-based type of sexual education setting. And that's true, really, of the country at large, but more so in religious cultures. And um, and so now we're finding the, the research shows that those who grow up in those types of cultures are more distressed by behavior that doesn't follow their value system and seek treatment from these types of models at more at higher rates. And um, and yeah, it just kind of fits the framework. But you're not saying there is no treatment model that you advocate you're just basic but right now you're saying people don't know that these other models are out there or these other sorts of treatment um, modalities are there well and i'm sure we'll get into this more in depth as we go along with the interview but the idea is that treating the behavior 
treating a symptom. It is not treating an underlying problem. So one of the push, classic pushbacks that we get is, well, then you must be pro-porn or you must be about anything goes or, you know, you don't care about sexual values at all. That's not what me and Kristen are about. But if you have, for example, let's say somebody who comes in with um, heart disease and you're trying to treat a symptom of that instead of the actual coronary arteries, you're not really going to get to the problem okay. underneath. Great. Anybody else, Kristen, it seemed like maybe it was you trying to jump in a little bit or to explain that connection with why this is the preferred model of those perhaps who have a religious worldview, or at least a conservative one. Natasha nailed it on the, I mean, it fits right into our framework. And I think it packages up the, com the complexity of sexuality in a neat, nice package. It feels safe. It feels, okay, here's a problem. Here's the solution. And people feel secure in, in the whole thing around that. And it allows people to have to avoid talking about sexuality, which I think is very scary. And unfortunately, we have little to no training on how to do that. None of us grew up with conversations or sex ed, typically in the school system or in the home. And so what this op-ed says, I know that we're talking about science, but something that's really important in here in the countering op-ed, and this keeps coming up, is that they're not talking about sex, they're talking about porn. And that's a really confusing statement to me because how do you talk about porn without addressing sexuality? And so to me, we're really missing the point that this is getting in schools and is a form of, poor, or of sex education, but is not being called as such because everyone agrees with the messaging around it. Going back to what Natasha said is it fits our model, it fits our framework, it fits our values. Our values being that sexuality is meant really only within a marital relationship. And even in that marital relationship, it's to be chaste and virtuous and pure and responsible. And so any type of pornography or premarital sex or anything like that does not fit into our Mormon framework as far as a value system. And that is okay. It's okay if you want to have values that do not support certain types of sexuality. We have never made a statement that values should change. However, when that value system is used as a treatment protocol, that's where we have a problem. Awesome. Jay and Nikki, anything on this? What is it? Uh, I guess would be say this, this maybe unspoken but prevalent preference for this model, the addiction model? Is it simply because what you're offering and what you're talking about is new and just kind of coming into consciousness and the other one was simply, you know, been in place through 12-step programs and, and things for a century and whatnot? Or is it is it really that we prefer it to be named and handled with some solutions that we already know about? I think some of the connection to the addiction model is actually reflecting a basic misunderstanding of science. So I think people don't understand that the way science works is we see a behavior that's a problem for some people and we try and identify the best model that describes that behavior for the biggest number of people who are experiencing it. What I think the people who are struggling with this and the religious groups are hearing is it's either addiction or it's nothing. Mm. And that's not mm. how science works. So what I see a lot is, you know, how could you say, you know, this is terrible, people are suffering. And we say, well, yes, <laughs> that's exactly who we're studying. Uh, we hear you. Um, but, you know, to them, it's if we don't call it an addiction, then we're saying that these people are faking it or they're jerks or they don't really have a problem. And that's not the case at all. Uh, science works on a falsification basis. Uh, that means when we look at all these different models, we try and find ways of testing them, uh, kind of crucial tests to see if they really fit and describe behaviors. And there are lots of models that could fit and describe uh, this kind of problem sexual behavior. Uh, addiction was one of them, but it's been falsified. That means we need to look for a different model that better explains those behaviors. And I think it's just a basic misunderstanding of science to think that it's either addiction or nothing. And that's why the religious groups have glommed onto it. Awesome. Terrific. Jay? You know, I agree with all that. And I also would say that the addiction model is really emotionally appealing. There's just no doubt that uh, sex and sexuality is one way religions create a framework for people to live their lives. And that it, you know, all religions create a path for people to live 
that meet their criteria and, you know, avoiding using the word control, but if I look from another perspective, that's what it is. How do you get people, control people so they behave in the way you want? Um, and sex and sexuality is used in religions uh, in that way. And so we are all brought up emotionally to have this baggage, this sex negative perspective about there are certain behaviors, certain things about sex, enjoying sex that, you know, hold some shame with them. And so I think the addiction model resonates with people because um, it, it matches with that emotional framework that they have. And it fits and says, yeah, this is it. I can't, I'm not a bad person. I just can't control myself. This is happening. And then that's getting leveraged by people who frankly just want to make money off of it. Um, it is a great way. If I can come to you and say, hey, here's this thing that I, you can pay me money to fix that we all agree is a bad thing and it resonates with you that it feels bad versus, hey, here's this, and porn is great because it's very discreet. I can show you porn. You know, you can, we can tell all the stories of why it's bad. If I come and say, this really has to do with emotions and your own self-worth and self-esteem, that's a lot harder sell. And so I think the tie to, the, to religion is that it's consistent with this idea that sex and sexuality has certain values to it. And uh, so it gets, it's an easy thing to leverage and it resonates with people emotionally. And then what Nikki said is it doesn't, it's not backed up by the science. Thank you. So there's the issue of it's not backed up with the science. And Nikki, you talked about falsification, and that's how science advances and, and says this theory needs to move on and we need to come up with that. Is there, do you feel like there is a strong enough in place alternative that you guys are offering, that you're articulating for uh, people to actually recognize it? Is it coming up into their consciousness? Is it is it coming up in any kind of way, in a way that people could make an informed choice before they choose therapy that's under one model versus the other? Or is this a problem of you guys being new? You've, you're, you're finding their data not to hold up, but yet you're not big enough yet or something. Uh, Nikki or Jay? Sure. There are three other models that I think are the best candidates so far, and we have different intervention strategies for each of them. So the first would be a model of compulsivity, and you can apply a type of obsessive compulsive treatment to that potentially, depending what it looks like. And there are many treatments that have shown to be effective for OCD that might have sexual features. So this is not something new, uh, and it looks very different than an addiction treatment model. So the potential conflict there is if you continue to treat it as an addiction that's been falsified and the behavior is really better modeled as a compulsive behavior, then you're providing the wrong treatment. You're not helping patients. Another model that we're investigating is a high sex drive. So that's more a matter of having a strong urge where you may need help uh, identifying methods for managing that drive in appropriate context. And another model we're investigating is a social shame model. And this is what's been talked about a little bit already. That is the idea uh, that the problem behavior actually is no different than the rest of the population. And we see this a lot in sexuality. So, for example, lots of studies showing guys, for example, who think they have uh, rapid ejaculation problems when they're tested in the lab actually don't respond any more rapidly than other guys. Uh, so it's a very common uh, problem in sexuality to have a misperception of your functioning. And the social shame uh, suggests that, that people have this perception that they have a problem in this domain when really they're not different or using it differently from other people. It's just a values conflict for them. And each of these three models suggest very different treatments that we have tested interventions for. And how well known in the literature for the, the marriage and family therapists, sex addiction people and things are, or excuse me, sex therapists and uh all the credentials that certified sex therapists uh, you guys have. How well known is it there versus these are just emerging models? And is it just a question of uh, needing the time for, for the thinking to be done and the wrestling among the people? Yeah, I think the compulsivity model seems very well known. And in fact, uh, what's kind of funny about Fight the New Drug and some of these other LDS organizations um, is that by and large, you know, LDS therapists. So, you know, I talked to the counselors at BYU um, and some, they don't consider it an addiction. They're not treating it that way. It's oh, really just activists who have this position. Okay. It's really unique to the activists in this area. So there are, you know, some of the, we would love to have large treatment controlled trials for some of this, which we don't have yet, but there are a number of smaller uncontrolled trials. And it's always better to use something with some data than to try and be using treatment that has no data, which is what they're currently doing. 
Well, I'll just piggyback on something that Jay said, and then I'd like to hear more from him as far as what his perspective is on this. But I know that as an LDS counselor myself, when I first went to my first Stephanie Carnes event, it was very seductive. And one thing that I hope that we get into um, with Nikki on board is, I mean, they are, the op-ed that they're listing shows, I mean, if you're just reading that as a layperson, basically shows that there's tons and tons of studies that do support their claims. And Stephanie Carnes is the daughter of Patrick Carnes, who started the sex addiction uh, certification for therapists. And so, you know, when Jay says there's people who are in it for making money, I completely agree with that. I also know that there are many, many LDS therapists and counselors and other Christian counselors who really believe this, who really believe that this is supported by the data and who believe that this is how they are helping their clients have healthier marriages and healthier lives. So it gets complicated because it's not just the public. I, I mean, I can understand why the public is completely confused. It took me 10 years to figure out how to not to be confused and getting a certification in sex therapy before I wasn't confused about this. And it's very typical to see, well, here's one, here's one opinion and here's another opinion. And really this isn't about opinions. This is about, there's no data to support the addiction model for treating sexuality. There is no data supporting that. So it is not about opinions or one method versus another. It's not like cognitive behavioral therapy versus using hypnosis. It's not the same. I, I would agree to that. One, I don't mean to imply that everyone's in it to make money. I think there are a lot of people who are. Uh, but I think there are some very sincere, well-meaning, good therapists who have who believe in the in in it, even if I don't believe they should. I don't think it comes from a malicious place. So I do want to uh, make sure I'm clear about that. That uh, I agree with you. Um, and I also, and just one other point, I would like to I would put a little twist on what you said is when we say there's no data supporting it. I could argue that's a matter of how you present it. There, there is tons of data out there, and I can choose to represent the data how I want, and that's what that's what happens. Is somebody will say, well, here's a study, and this is how I interpret this study, so there's data supporting it. Other people will look at it and say, that's not a correct interpretation of that, and that's, I think, where we have some big issues is we will see sex addiction supporters take certain research and say, this supports our model. We're saying, no, you're totally misconstruing what that says. So... To say there's no data, you're going to get immediate pushback on that. We just don't believe there's data that credibly supports it. It's uh, what is out there has either been refuted or uh, is misinterpreted. Um, so I, in regards to who's using what, I agree it, there's a lot of confusion. And to be honest, you know, a lot of therapists aren't trained in hard science. And so I run into, you know, colleagues who aren't that good at interpreting research. And so they're looking for guidance from people. And that was uh, referenced earlier that I was involved in. Uh, one of the things was kind of pushing back against the Association of American Family Therapists, which is a professional organization for uh, marriage and family therapists, who had some information on their website that was, in my opinion, based on complete misinterpretation of data. And I think any reasonable person would, would think that. But yet here's this national organization saying this, and in my mind is completely inaccurate and that, that but it was difficult to get any movement on that because there's also people pushing back from the other side um so i yeah. think both for therapists trying to figure this out it's a challenge and then it's even more difficult for uh clients to figure out because you know most clients don't say i'm going to go look at research to decide what kind of therapy to use right they're trusting professionals. You know, you, I don't really do that before I go see the doctor. Um, I rely on them to tell me. And so you hear, oh, this person, they look credible. They've got all these letters after their name. I'm going to go see them. And if they say this is the model and this is what's going on. Now, what I think is that for some clients that resonates and some it doesn't. I see people who come and say, you know, I went, they started doing this treatment this way and I completely reacted to it and refused to do it and so I quit going there and so I look for somebody else who did it differently other people if it emotionally resonates with them stick with it and that doesn't mean it's based in you know whether it's good science or not it's just they're trying to make the best decision they can but I don't think they have the information they need to make good decisions either yeah terrific Nikki I I know we have you less 
you know, for less time than everybody else. And you got your data crunching in the background and stuff while you're talking to us. Let's just focus on the pieces that you really can help us understand uh, right now, if that if that's OK. And then we'll kind of talk to these larger meta and religious and, you know, the specific where it intersects with Mormonism and all those things later. But would you share with us? Um, when Natasha and Jay or somebody might say there's literally no data that supports the the porn addiction model, um, what is it that you that you say isn't? Because like I say, that second op-ed that was responding to the other one is you know here's a link: 26 scientific studies on porn. Uh, there there's somebody who's taking on the Steele study. Uh, I don't know you know if, if we need to know that term or whatever. So they're they're claiming research. Would you just take as long as you need to, to, to kind of frame good science, bad science. It says this, it doesn't say that kind of stuff. Sure. So they were doing a lot of sleight of hand, which is their, their MO, their modus operandi typically with science. You believe that they know they are. Yes. It's intentional. Okay. I, I don't know if it's intentional on all their parts, but there are several of them who I know are aware of what they're saying is incorrect and they, persist in saying it. And what's interesting is the authors of all of that response letter, none of them were scientists, not one. And yet they have this huge section in their letter called science. <laughs> so uh, we already have written a response and we have six neuroscientists who've signed so far. We'll see how many more come on board, all agreeing that their science was misrepresented. And some of the typical ways they misrepresent it, which they've also done here is, for example, they say, you know, so, so many studies have found that negative uh, effects occur when you view sex films. All of those studies, not one of them asked about positive effects of sex films. When studies do ask about positive effects, they find that they're overwhelmingly positive, not negative. Uh, in a large population-based study, uh, they asked people if they'd had, if they had ever viewed erotica and then if they had problems with their viewing, of people who viewed, it was less than 2% of men and less than 1% of women reported any problems with their viewing. And I can go on and on, but it's basically the studies that they're citing. It's true. Some do say, you know, the more you view, uh, it's related to this, it's related to that. But there are two issues there. One is they never asked about the positives. So it's impossible to say, oh, it's only negative. Well, if you only asked about negatives, <laughs> then there's nothing else there. You know, when we do ask about positives, it's overwhelmingly positive. And it's also the correlation causation issue, which they just pretend doesn't exist. Now, and I think uh, most people okay. are that. Now, with the reason they're not asking this is because, again, the religious framework that can really only fit – you know, sex films and these other things you're talking about in a this is bad model, or were they deliberately like to know if these studies were sponsored by a group that had investment in the porn addiction model and, you know, um, charging people, that kind of stuff? Some of them are that. So a lot of the studies they cited appeared in predatory journals. And what people need to know in science is sometimes something will say the journal of important things. And <laughs> you think, well, that sounds like a journal. It sounds peer reviewed. Not necessarily. And many of the studies they're citing appear in predatory journals. That means that they paid to publish them there. They probably were not peer reviewed. And they don't have an impact factor, which is a common measure of quality of journals. So many of the things that they're citing actually aren't respected by any scientist. It's just something that they have put out themselves personally to try to counteract the science that does exist. Uh, and that's something okay. that's very difficult for a person to know if you're not a scientist. Thank you. Uh, keep going. Sorry to interrupt you there. Tell us more about uh, the, the nature of the studies versus what the neuroscience really does show. What we have looked at with a series of the studies is it is absolutely the case that sex films are pleasurable, that we enjoy them. Uh, people report a lot of other positive emotions, not just sexual arousal when they view sex films. Um, and in that sense, it looks like other addictions. And they typically use that comparison and run with it. And they say, yes, it's exactly the same. And that's clearly not the case because these reward areas that become active in the brain are responsible for learning. They're active even when we learn negative things, when we learn positive things. So the fact that it's like addictions makes it also like anything else we learn. So it's really not, uh, it does have to be there uh, for something to be considered an addiction, but it is not at all diagnostic. And they're trying to pull a fast one on the public. 
uh, suggesting that these two things are comparable. So for example, uh, one of the materials I saw from Fight the New Drug claimed that porn was 65 times, I think it said, as addictive as cocaine. You actually can't make that statement scientifically. It's impossible. So they are definitely falsifying information and trying to create fear using this information. Uh, now, some of the other features that have to be present to call something an addiction uh, is something we call Q reactivity. And I can go into that in more detail if you care, but if not, the short version is we tested Q reactivity in the largest neuroscience study of the topic to date, and uh, it failed. Porn uniquely failed um, in contrast to any other substance. We've also conducted a series of behavioral studies, and these have been replicated by the laboratory showing things like uh, erectile function is not related to viewing of erotic films, that uh, people's ability to regulate their sexual arousal actually is not related uh, to either their viewing behavior or their feelings of distress around their viewing behavior. So they're just a series of things that, yes, you know, people report and they believe that they have these problems, but if they don't hold up in the laboratory, then that's not the proper model. And they like to gloss over these and pretend like, oh, it's, you know, there's just one study. And so that, I think that's why they fought me so hard, <laughs> uh, you know, I had such incredible uh, kind of misogyny around trying to attack our work is because they think only the brain matters. And in fact, there have been many studies that have falsified many different aspects of the addiction model. Some are neurological, some are cognitive, uh, some are more behavioral. Uh, there are just many that exist. That does not mean that these people don't have a problem, but we're trying to look at other models that can better characterize the behavior because the addiction model has failed in many ways already. Super. Um... Does anyone else want to amplify that before I ask a, a few more questions about the studies? No, I could keep hearing her talk, so have her <laughs> <Nice keep going>. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me, let, so here, here's what to me, so you talk about the, these parts of the brain light, light up, and so they're saying, just like when heroin or just like when alcohol or just like when this or that comes into the body, these areas, these pleasure centers light up. And that's their, that seems to be their, their big thing so that before fight the new drug comes in, you know, 43% believe this and afterwards 90% believe it because they're, they're talking about those kinds of things. Has anyone deliberately said to them, because it just seems so obvious to me that these other things that are substances are an introduction of new molecule, you know, new molecules into this to the body versus just things endemic already in the body doing what they normally do when, you know, pleasure or pain and all the different things come up there. How have they handled saying it's just like addiction or it is addiction when there's clearly nothing going on um, chemically? that's different? Or have I overstated that, simplified it too much? No, I've seen that argument. And I think they've had two responses to it. So there are people who study what they call behavioral addictions. And these include things like gambling and eating uh, for some scientists. And there's, as you might imagine, quite a lot of debate around those as well. Right. But those also didn't fail Q reactivity studies, which porn did. And, and QE, is that two letters, Q and E, or is it a, a word that spells out? So Q, reactivity, it's like C-U-E. Okay. Um, so uh, Q and then their, how reactive the brain is to that okay. Q. Okay. Okay. And so one argument it, they try to make is that it sh should be considered in context of other behavioral addictions, so not these exogenous addictions. Although I've heard the head uh, CEO of Fight the New Drug say, oh, well, we think it's more like cigarettes now. And it's like, what? <laughs> Nobody thinks that, but they just say these things, kind of throw them out. So I, I don't know that they're pushing that viewpoint as hard. The other argument that they make is that porn is a super stimulus, they call it, which is ridiculous. Uh, there's no evidence that porn drives anything endogenously in the body harder than any other sexual stimulus than anything that's available in the environment without consumption, but they like these fear words, you know, so like they use neuroplasticity, which just means learning, but it's a fancier word. Um, they use super stimulus, which is really meaningless, but it's a lot of these fear terms that they try and, you know, glom onto to make it sound like uh, these two things map together and they don't. 
Awesome. Thank you for that. Please, anybody else jump in with either what I just talked about there about you know, some external substance versus not, or just anything that you want Nikki to focus on that you know that she's great at that uh, we can pick her brain while we still have her. Nikki, something I think that would be really helpful for you to elaborate on would be why can't it be compared to cocaine? Like you said, it's impossible. And that's a really common thing we butt up against of it's as addictive as cocaine. And I'd really be interested to hear you expand on that point. There is not an addictiveness meter. You cannot put a dipstick into someone and say you have two units of addictiveness. (laughs) But they try and make that argument. Uh, Neuroscientists are very familiar with that misrepresentation. We see it all the time. Uh, It's a very common fallacy that's presented to the public about addictions in general. And people try and make those parallels. Uh, Some of the ways they might try to do that is they may see units on uh, fMRI, so neuroimaging uh, paper that looks at the bold signal, which is the output from fMRI, and they say, oh, well, you know, I saw this uh, one number here. The number on the porn thing was 4.2, and the number on the other one was 0.3. Therefore, you know, they divide the two numbers. What they don't know is that those biological signals are relative. What that means is exactly the dipstick issue. That is, like with temperature, that's an absolute measure. You know, if you are uh, 96 degrees (laughs) Fahrenheit and the other person is 96 degrees Fahrenheit, we know something about your health. With bold signal, with neuroimaging, uh, and also with EEG actually, electroencephalography, uh, they're relative. So if I am at four units and you're at eight units, you are not twice as EEG as I am. (laughs) It doesn't work that way. They're all done within subjects and looking at change over time. So it's a bit of a complex issue, which I think is part of how they gloss over it and try and make it sound scarier. Um, But it's a basic misunderstanding of physiology and statistics. It's an issue of relative versus absolute measures, uh, where they want to try and claim that these two things are similar Uh, in terms of magnitude. And I think you were hitting on something else as well, that is how does it look similar to and different from cocaine in terms of just the pattern of activity. So one is the magnitude of activity, but then also the pattern of activity. And it does share some of the features um, as any reward does. So uh, something that sex films do is we typically feel pleasure from them and we also feel motivated Uh, to behave, that is to learn. And these are two separable systems. Uh, In the past, we used to think they were the same and Fight the New Drug still makes that error uh, because they don't have a neuroscientist helping them. They don't know that those are two different things. And uh, we see activity uh, that is similar between both drugs of abuse and sex films in that case. So they do look similar in terms of if you just expose people to them, uh, that you see these kinds of patterns. But what's important is the pattern over time. So uh, for example, the Q reactivity is the main differentiator for these. And what that basically means is when someone sees a drug of abuse, uh, their brain kind of highlights it for them and says, hey, watch that. You know, that's important. We like that. We want to go after that. In the case of porn, it's the opposite. So not just that we can't find evidence, but that people who report problems with sex film viewing actually are less reactive very early in their brain's response. Now, later on, we see some evidence uh, for what you could call habituation, although the data are mixed in that area. Um, So it's basically the Q reactivity has been called a biomarker of addiction. It is that clear. It has been seen in every other substance and behavioral addiction, and it is not present for porn. So uh, I would say it's diagnostic and that it's not present for sex films. Super. Anybody else? I would ask. Yeah, yeah, I would ask too. So if you wouldn't mind maybe from a neuroscientist perspective explaining how we can understand the difference between compulsivity and addiction, that would be one. And then the other is that I believe a lot of these studies are done with people who maybe present with problematic behavior. And the problem then also is that we don't have scans or tests to show what their brain activity would have been like prior to having a problem. I I know the seagulls talk about this quite a bit and I don't know if if I'm making myself clear, but it's not like you have an understanding of 
what that brain looked like to begin with. So in other words, now we're blaming the porn when maybe there was another diagnostic issue, like you're saying, high libido or OCD type tendencies or whatever that, that the brain could have been affected by other than porn. Absolutely. You see these scientists uh, just screaming at the top of their lungs, trying to get fight the new drug to stop misinterpreting their studies. So for example, I've seen them say that porn shrinks the brain. That study by Simone Kuhn and her colleagues never said porn shrinks the brain, and she has repeatedly said that it is not causal, uh, that these two things are correlative, and that there are lots of third variables that could explain the relationship. So it, I think the preceding issue is, again, that correlation causation uh, question, where two things can be related, but that does not mean they cause one another. And I think the important point that really hasn't been uh, mentioned in a lot of this discussion is people aren't watching porn with popcorn. <laughs> if they're not, you know, they don't uh, think, oh, I'd like to see some adult films today. Uh, which fine cinema should I draw from? And they pop the popcorn and go sit on their couch so they can pull up the movie. They're masturbating. They're watching porn and masturbate. <laughs> So uh, what these studies have never done is separate the effects of masturbation from the films. So at this point, anything that they're trying to blame on sex films could just as easily have been attributed to masturbation. So the question is, if you're not attributing it to masturbation, then you're not being a scientist. You're making a value judgment. And so we do that in our studies. We separate, uh, in our case, we use sex drive and we also assay uh, masturbation behaviors, but because they are so strongly correlated, it is very difficult statistically to kind of take those apart. And so this correlation causation issue, uh, I think is very important with respect to attributing any negative effect that they're claiming actually to the sex films and not just to the masturbation behavior. So for example, you become upset in your relationship, you're fighting with your partner, you don't want to deal with them. And instead of trying to work it through, uh, you think, well, I'm just, I don't want to have sex with them anymore because I'm mad. And so you go and you masturbate. Now we have access to erotic films. So they happen to be watching the erotic films when they're masturbating. <laughs> and so people say, my goodness, look at this, you know, unsatisfaction is related to sex films. Well, no, it's not. It's related to sexual problems. And that's related to the masturbation habits. So until scientists start doing a good job of taking those two behaviors apart, they cannot make those attributions. I know they want to, and they try sometimes, but good scientists will acknowledge that these are correlative and that they don't know the actual cause. Thank you. Can I comment there quickly? Please. I would take it even a step further and say, not only separating those two, but you just heard that chain of events. And how often do we see that? that the problem is you had a fight with somebody or you were upset or your partner's out of town. So you find a way to get some sexual release and happen to watch porn. It, it may be, you know, the driver can be way back in the process. Right. Um, it has doesn't even have to be the effect of the masturbation versus the porn film. It's like, why are they even going to masturbate in the first place? There's plenty of reasons why that happens. Yes self-soothing and all the other yeah. things, yeah. I was gonna say, so it doesn't even have to be sexual problems. It can just be relationship issues in general or uh, of any type. But, and then if I can comment, ask Nikki, and I don't know if this makes sense or not, but, you know, I really like the where you talk about the fact that there's lots of steps in the process of determining whether there's something an addiction and, and sections of the brain lighting up is only one of them. Can you just name 10 other things that light up the brain the same way that we don't, would never imagine were addictive? Uh, sure. So Yanako Georgiatis has written a paper on this, actually a review that was a long time ago and talked about pleasures in the brain and various things that activate these uh, kinds of reward circuits. So uh, anytime you're learning things, uh, we see similar patterns when people look at images of puppies playing, because those are things we see them and we think, oh, they're adorable and we want to go play with them. Like we have a strong approach motivation associated with that. I have never heard anyone argue that puppies are addictive. Um, we see some similar patterns, not as much uh, with certain aspects of television watching. Uh, in the past, people have made arguments about uh, whether or not television might be addictive, but we don't see that anymore. I think it was just the you know, addiction fashion, perhaps, at the time it came out. Uh, but now we know that was more of a tech panic, and uh, we don't really see that discussed anymore. 
Uh, chocolate is another favorite. Um, so if you uh, give people not only images of chocolate, but this has actually been tested with taste as well. Uh, it activates areas of the brain that have been associated with uh, addictive substances as well. Uh, it doesn't just happen with deserted sugars, but also happens with rich foods. Uh, some people have described cheese as being in this category as well. It's not quite as well established, but it, it has a, there's one publication with it at least. Uh, and it doesn't have to be uh, pleasant things as far as the reward circuitry is concerned. So uh, rewards doesn't mean positive, right? It just means it's reinforcing the behavior. So it could be something negative that you're learning about um, fighting, for example. Um, if you uh, get a rush out of approaching someone and, uh, or you really like boxing, uh, then those images, so for example, there was a study done uh, University of Florida and showing them images of the Gator football team uh, activated the brain in ways that were similar to addiction, addictive patterns in terms of the curie activity at least. So, you know, there are lots of different uh, behaviors and quote unquote substances and things that rely on these circuits because they're not special. They don't do anything that is special for addiction. So anytime you see someone refer to an addiction circuit, they don't know what they're talking about because there is no addiction circuit. These are all general circuitries that are being used in a variety of different ways in the brain. And we think that there are certain constellations of patterns that are more uh, descriptive for substance addictions. So it, I think, Jay, that's a great question because it's there are so many uh, things that engage those systems in the brain. They are not unique. It is not diagnostic, but it is so sexy to see a picture of a brain and put them side by side. And what I love to do in my talks is put a picture of chocolate by it uh, and start out as though I'm going to give a talk about porn being addicting. And then I drop the image and I show that it was chocolate and it wasn't cocaine. And people, I hope, felt seduced initially. You know, they started to believe it and I uh, learned to question their over-reliance on these sexy brain pictures. That is, you are really being, uh, in some cases have to be, you know, spoon fed because it's not your area and you're relying on the interpretations of the person who, up, person who is up there. And if they're from Fight the New Drug or a religious organization or they're an activist, like one of the authors on these letters, there's no reason to think they know what they're talking about and they're probably misrepresenting it to you. Thank you so much. And there's two questions I have for you that maybe, uh, well, one, one talks right there at the, the thing you were talking about last and the other one goes back a little bit further, but the one right there at the end was you're saying the brain can't show addictive circuits or, or things like this, but, but, Obviously, it's the other body systems that actually do show different receptor levels and various things happening in the body, right? You're just talking pure brain right there as far as addiction goes versus... Well, so they're kind of. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, within the body, for example, uh, there are certainly specific receptors. So, for example, the nicotinic receptors obviously are key in looking at cigarettes, um, and those modulate independently for... Uh, cigarettes independent of cocaine, independent of porn, as far as we know. I don't think that study's been done, but that would be my guess. Um, so there are some more specific, physiologically specific systems in the periphery of the body. Um, but there again, you know, not all of them. There are some commonalities where you might argue that, you know, viewing sex films um, can be exciting. It can be relaxing if you have an orgasm. And, uh, you know, the body is the body. That is the only thing that's really physiologically specific that we know of is genital responses for a sexual response. Um, and that's pretty unique within psychophysiology. Most of those systems are very general and they operate on, uh, you know, for multiple purposes. They kind of have to uh, slave to uh, a lot of different functions. And I'm sorry to not be more specific, but the, uh, the broad idea is just, you know, the, the body does not have um, a lot that is special for addictions. But what is unique about these exogenous substances is you take them in and you can uh, think about it as overclocking. If you're a computer scientist, you can drive the body to do something that it wasn't meant to do and that it's not able to do on its own. And they're making that argument with porn and there is no evidence for that. Interesting. 
so interesting and complex. The other thing was, I noticed you often would you would never say the word pornographic film. You would say sex films, erotica, and things like that. And I'm and it, so at first I was thinking, oh, it's anything that you know, like super softcore porn or instructional videos could be, and that you're talking about and that were studied. When you say those things, are you mostly talking about porn where you, you know, the typical, you know, triple X, let's show the, you know, the full on thing and it, it maybe have all these other things going with it? Or, and I guess the reason I'm asking that, if that's just a preference or if that's like the industry standard to call them sex films. But I'm also worried or wondering if the studies have sort of uh, looked at soft core versus harder core stuff. In science, we typically refer to sex films as either visual sexual stimuli, and then we'll abbreviate it VSS, or we'll call it sexually explicit media and abbreviate it SEM. Interesting. So, cool. Yeah, not uh, quite as easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So one of the things that kind of stands out is one easy way to identify uh, someone with a biased viewpoint is to see if they just call it pornography, because that's commonly considered to have a negative connotation. And it's just the culture these days, you know, it's... Um, the old uh, adage, of course, is I know it when I see it. Uh, the idea being that it arouses prurient interests and that it's something that is negative uh, is not a scientific stance. So that's why we don't refer to it generally as pornography. Now, sometimes I will, or I'll try and put it in quotes the first time at least right. to acknowledge that I'm making that switch uh, to just the general usage because it can be a mouthful. Um, but that's <laughs> that's kind of the only reason. Okay. And then um, what about studies? Have they looked at, you know, sort of the milder forms versus the more hardcore in any of these? There have been two studies that differentiated uh, sex film types that I'm aware of. One looked at uh, interest in different types of films over time. So they found that people who initially reported looking at what we would call maybe more vanilla films uh, were more likely to look at uh, BDSM images over time, so these kind of bondage, domination, sadism, masochism. Yay! <laughs> I'm always happy when I can get them all. Uh, these BDSM films later, and some people have used that to argue that they're that's evidence of desensitizing, that they're seeking out more and more explicit media, but they actually didn't show that, because to show that, they would have to show that they transitioned to just viewing those films and were no longer viewing the more tame films, and that's never been shown. Uh, so there was one study looking longitudinally that people do, you know, they explore different types of films, that seems to be the case, uh, but there's no evidence that they then stick to them and require them, which is the argument of the porn addiction. And then the other study making the comparison is my study. Uh, so we looked at people who uh, were either viewing more softcore, so the, our, in our case, softcore was showing images of people kissing where it was kind of suggestive that they were nude, but it usually wasn't totally clear. And that was contrasted uh, with matched images of people having intercourse that you could see uh, in consensual vaginal intercourse and just one man and one woman. So still pretty tame <laughs> by, by standards. But standards the, yeah. yeah, but the explicitness definitely varied. So one was clearly more softcore, one was clearly more hardcore. And what was interesting in that study, and this actually went to a pretty good journal because uh, it was the first time it had been shown, we linked that to actual sexual behaviors. And people who had had uh, more sex partners in their life uh, were strongly responsive uh, brain-wise to both the softcore and the hardcore. And people who had had fewer partners in their lifetime were less responsive to the softcore. So what that suggested to us was some evidence that you know, people who have more partners, uh, Eureka, <laughs> probably have stronger drive uh, because they're excited by more things. They have a lower threshold. Uh, but that was the first time it had been demonstrated. And uh, so there is some differentiation in, in that area. But I expect there's going to be more interest in kind of differentiating film types as we try and do more studies looking at this idea of need and broadening and really get more detail about how people are using erotica over time. Super. Thank you so much. Anybody else? What about the compulsivity versus addiction? Could you give like three sentences on that? <laughs> oh, like the differences in those two models? Yeah, yeah, because a lot of people just say, well, that's just calling it same behavior, two different things. So who cares what we call it and who cares how we treat it? Lots of people try and say it doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, we argue that models matter. 
some of the differences between a compulsivity model and an addiction model lead to very different treatments, very different interventions. The main difference between those two treatment types is the abstinence goal. So with addiction models, uh, certainly we have a history of some harm reduction and there's that competition in substance treatments, but overwhelmingly people usually have an abstinence goal if you are treating with an addiction model. How realistic that is, we don't know, and there's some evidence that it can actually be harmful in substance treatment. So this is the idea that uh, you should never look at erotica again. And if you do, you start over from day zero because you were a failure. Uh, that is a very different model from compulsivity, where compulsivity is more about uh, you've gotten into this habit uh, that you're doing too much of, uh, you feel compelled to engage in it, and uh, you basically need to find a way to reduce that behavior, but you don't necessarily need to eliminate it. You need to find ways to better manage it. Those are completely different treatment goals <laughs> in terms of how you're approaching it. Uh, and with a compulsivity, for example, you may actually have an exposure type approach where you're looking at how can we get you to view sex films in a way that is more useful for you and less interfering with your life. I can't imagine someone doing that with an addiction model. <laughs> that seems completely at odds. So uh, if the addiction model is wrong and we think there's sufficient data to say that it is, and you treat someone using an addiction model, you could be harming them. Because again, like they have this wagon uh, model where if you, you know, view any kind of a sexual stimulus or you masturbate once, you've fallen off the wagon and you're, you are now a fallen person, maybe a bad person, right. and you have to start over. And this failure model in substance has been shown to be detrimental in some cases. So people just say, well, hell with it. I failed anyway. I might as well go on a bender. Uh, I don't want to do that to people unless there is a reason to think that's a better treatment, and currently there's not. Super. Nikki, I don't know if you have anything on this or if this is more for the therapist, but they reference the Coolidge effect all the time. Any comments about that? The Coolidge effect is something that people who are pro-sex addiction often cite as though it's something special. The Coolidge effect is not at all unique to addiction, so it's not evidence of addiction to begin with. They also sometimes uh, try and argue that women can't become addicts, that they're not going to, but the Coolidge effect has been demonstrated in women just as well as men uh, in rodent models and in animals. So that's certainly not the case. Uh, if they want to use that to try and argue that there's a gender difference, well, it's not present in the, in the Coolidge effect. I don't know what the Coolidge effect is. <laughs> yeah, so we should, I was just realizing I should probably back up. So uh, the Coolidge effect most simply is the idea that if you're presented repeatedly with a similar sexual partner, the same sexual partner, that your responsiveness decreases over time. And if you're presented with a novel partner, that you spontaneously recover interest. This has been demonstrated also with uh, models of uh, sexual imagery in humans. So if you show someone the same brief sex film or same sexual images over and over, their sexual response becomes less and less to that same thing over time. And when you show them a new one, it tends to recover. What's interesting about this is that it demonstrates a basic learning effect that's not unique to sex. <laughs> so uh, some people have tried to argue um, and looked for in humans whether there's anything unique about that recovery. So we see this in any type of uh, reward or reinforcement, uh, that there's a simple recovery when you present a novel stimulus. And uh, as far as I've ever seen, there's no evidence that in that recovery there's anything different. It's just the fact that you've been presented with something new. So they use this to argue, well, porn is incredible because you get a new partner every single time, and so you're uh, capitalizing on the Coolidge effect. Uh, that's not true. That's never been demonstrated with erotica in the way that internet porn is used. So, you know, you're constantly being uh, shown new images, probably looking at different partners. We don't know a lot about how people use erotica. So, for example, like how many films is typical for people to look at? We have no idea, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, but this idea that uh, there's something special and unique about erotica has yet to be demonstrated. I mean, there there's, uh, there's nothing that suggests it's any different than simple learning. 
they again use this kind of fake neurosciencey language to call it a super stimulus, uh, as though there's something special or different about erotica from anything else you would look at or learn. Uh, and there's just no evidence for that. You know, if you're not making the same argument for television, then you can't make it for porn. And uh, you know, they don't have the data there. That again, you know, being a scientist, these are things that if there were data supporting that, I could change my mind on it, but I don't see it now. Uh, all the related data I've seen don't make any argument for that being particularly unique. I do think that it exists. You know, there's evidence uh, for it, uh, strong evidence in rodent models. There's some evidence in human models uh, for both men and women, but how much that's driving people's unique problems with it, we have no evidence that those two things have been linked. Thank you. Dr. Prowsey, thank you so much for being with us. I'll, we can let you go if you're ready to get back to your stuff. Uh, we'd love to have you stick around if you want to get talking more, you know, uh, religion and, uh, you know, cultures and all sorts of stuff. But uh, just thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Sorry to dominate. Uh, Y'all have fun. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nikki. Good luck. Thank you for joining us today on Mormon Matters Podcast. To discuss this podcast with others, please check us out at mormonmatters.org. Mormon Matters contains no ads, relying for its funding solely upon the support of people like you, its listeners. To keep it moving forward, please consider a monthly subscription or make a tax-deductible donation today at mormonmatters.org. Music for this podcast was brought to you by Shalan Hunt Clayson. You can hear more of her music by visiting her Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Shalans Music, C-H-E-L-A-N-S-M-U-S-I-C. The Mormon Matters logo was generously provided by studiocase.com. Thank you for listening. Searching my soul. No